like to introduce Steve Mason. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. Can you am I? Well, I am. Wow. I first of all have to apologize to my daughter who's out in the audience for performing on this stage before she gets a chance to do that. So I, my, my afternoon is going to be uh, a major challenge. I, I, I have, uh, and Jeff said it, I, I've been really engaged in a, a significant changing environment that's going on. But I think that's true to everything and from a not-for-profit point of view. And it, it's clear to me that one of the things that all of us as leaders, and I'm speaking to the board chairs and the executive directors and the CEOs in that audience, all of us as leaders often don't really know where it is that we're going to go, but you can't let people know that you don't know. So you, you know, never let them see your sweat kind of thing. But it is a challenge, and every job posting for an executive director or CEO that comes across my desk has this thing in it called visionary leadership. And I'm thinking, you know, and people have called me, Jeff just called me a visionary leader, and I, I ask myself, what does that really mean? When you go to the literature, there's four or five things that describe a visionary leader, but doesn't tell you anything about how. how I mean, what, what is the makeup of it? So what I thought I would do is spend a little time and talk about my journey in the sense of things that I think I've learned. Most of what I do, uh, I don't have a lot of words on. I, I use a lot of metaphors to talk about because I think when you get into looking at leadership style and how it is that we're effective, it really is about what's going on between our ears in terms of what that internal talk that we do. So let's start with some realities. One of the realities is that it's perfectly designed. Everything that you're doing is perfectly designed to get the result that you're getting. And as Einstein points out, if you do something over and over and expect a different result, that's insanity. And if you even go to quantum theory, if you look at the chaos theory, when you get down to the quantum level, down to the smallest particles in the universe, they are perfectly aligned. And the universe is continuously seeking balance. It may take thousands of years to seek balance. But everything is in balance and everything that's going on is perfectly designed to get the results that it's getting. So, you know, the biggest challenge that many of us have is to say, you know, what if we don't change at all uh, and something magical just happens? You know, that's, that would be a nice thing to think about, but it's fantasy. Magic happens sometimes, but it's happening as a result of something that is, is going on that's perfectly designed to get where it is. And the other thing that we know, and Darwin has contributed to this, you know, it's not the smartest that survive, not the most intelligent or the strongest. It's those that are able to adapt to change, like the duckbill platypus that's been around for centuries. So it's all about change in a big way. And that's one of those realities that we have to start with. I mean, I think that's one of the fundamental steps. And I like to talk about this, and I apologize to the economists in the room because they always tell me, now wait a minute, it's a lot more complex than this. But this is my simple definition of where we are and partly what has caused the, the, the chaos that, uh, that we're running into now and the challenges that we have. It's simply if you look at the history of the Dow Jones Industrial Average from over 1928, 68 years later it was at 4,000. And between 1995 and 2000, the economy tripled. We were at unemployment at 4%, almost dropped below 4%. We tripled the number of billionaires in the country, and we tripled the number of not-for-profit organizations. As a part of that uptick on that spike to get to the top up there was a dot-com boom. Then the next huge spike was part of the housing boom, and then the huge valley drops us down to 2008 and 9, and we all know what happened then. But since 2008 and 9, there's been a different sense. 
than there was in any other drop. There's a huge amount of cash in the economy, but it's not being able to be put to use because the economy is relatively stagnant and business is thinking differently about how to use those resources. And we've got a generation of people that are looking at fundraising in a much different way, at contributing. You know, my baby boom generation looked at things a whole lot different than my 36-year-old son or my 24-year-old daughter. I mean, it's not a problem, it's just the reality. You know, you try to communicate by telephone with your grandchildren and you, they don't answer the phone. They don't know that smartphone really has means phone on it because you call and you call and you call and, you know, you have to go, where are you? And 30 seconds later, you get four paragraphs of text tells you everything that they've done all day long. You know, how do you type that fast with your thoughts? I, I, have, I have no real understanding about that. But we're in an economy today that's different than it was. So we have to think differently. And it's through that process that I want to now talk a little bit about what I think we need to be doing. Because every product has a product life cycle. When you think about this product life cycle, and in the, in the panel this morning they talked some about about that, where you've got an introductory phase, a growth phase, a maturity phase, and then a declining phase. And successful organizations find themselves on the upward part of the growth phase and create a new curve to be able to jump from there before they get too deep into maturity and then going into decline. So part of what we have to do as leaders, particularly in a time of fairly turbulent change, is to reinvent ourselves. I mean, when was the last time you reinvented yourself? I think about it. I look back on the 40 plus years I've been in healthcare. I started in healthcare and military medicine in 1969, and I've been involved in various different things all along. Probably in that period of time, essentially had three major jobs, worked for three organizations, but when I look at it, I had nine different jobs. I reinvented myself multiple times because of the changes that are occurring. And I'm finding myself reinventing myself now because there's a 2,000 page federal law that was signed in February 2010 that changes the way healthcare gets reimbursed 180 degrees. And in that 2,000 pages, there's nothing that tells you how to go about doing it tells you all about what it is that you're going to have to do, but doesn't tell you anything about how to go about doing it. And if you look at, remember the floppy disk and the other disk and the CD, you know, if you're in the CD business and you think of that product life cycle, where do you think you are on that product life cycle? MP3 is eradicated. Uh, anybody have a car that has a cassette player in it now? Because, yeah, well, you, you've got a classic, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, okay. Oh, don't worry. I've, I still have a box of them in the garage that you can have because I don't have anything to play them on anymore. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've got to try to figure out what it is that, that we're going to be doing next. And that's the quandary. You get back to that first slide that says, well, what if we don't do anything and magic happens? You can't wait until the change occurs. The challenge with human beings is that they like their comfort zone, they like the status quo, and when the status, pressure on the status quo gets greater than the pressure to change, we change. But for a business, that's too late. When that pressure is there and you make that change, you have no infrastructure to move forward and to do anything effectively, and that's the challenge that we need to look at. So you've got to have a map somewhere, you know, all roads lead to the same place if you don't know where you're going. A part of that is to develop a strategy. And what I like to talk about with my leadership team, and I talk about this over and over, people think I'm kind of nuts, but you know, the most important thing that we need to focus on is this six and a half inches of space right here. Because in this space, we have the ability to make whatever choice we want. This can be the most glorious day that you've ever had or the most miserable. It's up to you, and you can change that in an instant. You know, I could get us so unhappy. 
in a few, that we would all be down. And then we could get up and sing and we'd all be feeling bad. I mean, this is where it all starts. And it has to start here. And it has to start from a leadership point of view, I believe, that focuses outside. You've got to get straight inside your head what it is that you've got to get done and all of your focus on the outside. Because it isn't how smart you are or how smart you appear to other people. It's how smart you make the people feel that work with you. That's what the main role of the leadership is. And the main role of the leader is to try to figure out where it is that we're going. So here's some of my little simple kinds of things to think about. First thing you have to do is decide that control is an illusion. It doesn't exist. How many of you are control freaks? I mean, I have to admit, I'm a recovering type A personality. My wife tells you, me that uh, that isn't always true that I'm recovering. Um, but the, the reality is, if you feel like you have to be in control of something, you're missing out on all of the messages that are telling you that the world is changing around you because you're fixed on trying to keep this status quo without changing. You have got to give up the sense of control. And when you do that, it's one of the scariest things in the world. But if you can get comfortable with that, it's liberating. You now set you free when you realize that you're in control of absolutely nothing. So how do you function? Well, you function by depending on the messages that are coming at you from the outside world. And they're, they've always been coming there. You just haven't noticed it. And they are messages that are coming from one of your board members or coming from people that you're working with. They're coming from things that you're reading. And you begin to think about how do these fit into the success of where you want to go, where you want to go once you have set up the key results that you're looking for. But it has to start with your, your fearless ability to give up control and recognize that you are in control of nothing. And then you need to make sure that you're looking at really difficult changes and that you challenge yourself with those difficult changes. Nothing comes easy. Success does not come easy. Every successful person that I know, that I've interviewed, will tell you about the major challenges when they were almost bankrupt, when they almost had these kinds of issues, or the competition came in and stole something. They didn't give up. It's kind of like changing an engine on an airplane in flight. Some of the things are really hard to do, but you've got to be willing to do it, and you've got to be willing to stay with it. I like this thought because when, when you think about it, and this is our Milky Way, and we're, we've got a, got a solar system inside of that, it's 123 million, bill, yeah, million light years across. And there's some 400 billion stars and perhaps that many planets in that Milky Way. And around it is an infinite space of universe. So you see that big blue star there? Let's pick that big blue star and let's say, that's everything that I know that I know. You know, there's a lot of things that I know that I know. I know mathematical formulas. I know how to do things. I know how to ride a bicycle. And then let's look at the Milky Way and be all those things that I know that I don't know. You know, think about something you know that you don't know. I know, no matter how many times somebody explains to me how that picture gets on that screen, the pixels and all of those things, I don't know how that picture gets there. And what really confused me is when they went wireless, then I was really scared, because I thought the pixels were coming up through that wire and causing that, and I had myself convinced. Then they go wireless, and now I really don't know. But I know that that picture goes there, and I know something about that. But it's infinite what we don't know that we don't know. So the challenge is whenever you've got an issue, wherever you've got to be looking at change, you've got to try to tap into that space of you don't know that you don't know. And part of what happens with that is your subconscious mind connected to wherever those things come from. And all of us have had the experience. I'm not being weird in, in any way, because every one of us has had the experience where something has popped into our head and we said, where did that come from? I never, 
you know, it just came from somewhere. I never thought of it. I never asked a question about it. I never saw it. And the answer came to you. Part of that whole process of giving up control and focusing on messages that are coming and asking questions about what's the meaning of this message. Somebody calls you up and invites you to go to lunch. You go to lunch. There's a message in that. It may just be a lunch. It may not. It may be something that helps you go in some other direction. And when you start talking to successful people, they'll, they'll tie back to these things. They'll understand that. And part of what that's doing is tapping into space that we don't know that we don't know. Because it's a comfort zone to deal with all those things that we know that we know or we know we don't know it. But in order for us to be innovative and creative and figure out in a change process, how do you get around that? You've got to find ways to figure out things that nobody else has thought of before or to explore and, and move into that. So part of what you can do to try to understand that is clearly, I always love this slide, is a 14-foot uh, white shark and a guy in about a 10-foot kayak. And, you know, you need a 360-degree view if, uh, if you're going to be doing visioning because uh, you never know when you might have a 14-foot shark that's uh, following you somewhere. The other thing that you need is plenty of open water. What I mean by plenty of open water, you've got you've to be able to, if you're going to move an organization, and Jeff described our organization, it's not the largest in the world, but it's pretty good size, and in order for us to make a meaningful change in something, it takes a long time. And I've got to be looking out there far enough with a leadership team to be able to make sure that we've got the infrastructure in place in order for us to really make a turn. And that we've communicated to hundreds, if not thousands, of people about making changes because they've got to be on board. I, I'm the farthest point from patient care in our organization. People that actually do the work, don't tell them that I don't do any work. The people that actually do the work are the ones that are taking care of patients, are the ones that are providing the services, that are working in the business office or fixing the plumbing in a facility somewhere. Those are the people that you've got to get lined up, and you need to be sure that you're focusing on getting the infrastructure in place in advance. So starting a change process when you see things coming becomes a critical thing to do. The other thing that's important is to look in negative spaces. Part of this process of trying to figure out things you don't know is to look at things from a different perspective, to look at it how they might solve something in a, in a different industry. Call somebody up that's working in an industry and say, you know, how, how would you work on this problem if they're an engineer and you're working in, in healthcare or some area? You might find new ways. So in those kinds of negative spaces, you see things that you might not ordinarily have seen. And, and create a new perspective. I mean, these are guys working on the radio tower of the Empire State Building. They have a different perspective of the way New York City looks than it does standing on the pavement. Change your perspective. Force yourself to do those things. Force yourself to go read something in quantum physics. Pick, pick a topic, something that you think has some kind of insight that's taking you into a different direction from where you're normal focus is. You know, the other thing is bad things will happen. Adversity is there always, and you, you need to be prepared for that. You need to shore up those, those potential problems that you're facing. This pilot uh, was, you know, very quick in terms of what uh, could have turned out to be a very, very bad day for him. And then <laughs> imagination. You know, take that inner child, get that inner child out. You know, you, you know, spend some time with one of your grandkids or one of your kids and, and ask them what they, how they'd solve your problems. You might actually find some insight into things, looking from an imagination point of view. But it's imagination is more important than knowledge. You know, knowledge is limited, but imagination is endless. It's part of that infinite space of stuff that we don't know that we don't know. And that's part of the way of tapping into that is creating and being more imaginative. So then coming back to looking at what my best advice is on what you can do. I mean, we're challenged. I imagine there's some organizations out here that 
are fund fundraising enough money to cover the expenses of the operation. I mean, that, that's a real challenge. And we all know what the challenge is on fundraising. In our organization, we have five foundations that we support. And I've seen fundraising change dramatically over the last five, ten years from where it was at one point in time. It's different expectations trying to meet different issues. Our focus needs to be then go back to the mission and ask ourselves, are we really broad enough or bold enough in our, in our mission? And when you look at the research on it, organizations that have a very bold mission and a very simple straight line focus on what it is that they're going to do to accomplish that mission and have metrics and are willing to do whatever it takes to achieve those are the ones that are most successful. A couple of examples, uh, well, let me, before I get to the examples, talk about this, because this leads to most everything that I talked about. If you're going to get through the maze, there's really three things, which is part of the success formula. Every successful person I've ever met has followed this. And the first is to create a clear vision. Use those techniques that I talked about earlier to create a vision, open up your thinking about that, try to look out into the future, get that open water from a focus point of view, get people that are outside of your industry to answer questions that you're trying to, trying to answer, and develop answers or questions to things that are answers, you know. I mean, there's an answer out there about is, is there global warming, uh, global warming? Well, yes, there is. But the question really is, what can I do about it? And is that something, if it's relevant within your, in your focus, just as an example, to be able to try to figure out how to deal with? The next step is commitment. That's why you've really got to build your leadership team and your, and your team around involvement in the development of that vision because you've got to get commitment. Duran says that the critical mass of an organization to make a change is the square root of N. So the square root of the number of employees that you have is what you need to start with that buy into and are fully committed to the vision that you're following. And then the not so easy thing is to do whatever it takes, to execute on it and to do whatever it takes. Those are really, it's, it's fairly, simple. It sounds simple. It isn't, as we know. But those are the three things that really give people opportunities for success. And then back to the examples, a, a great one, and, and Warren is, a, is a, uh, a great spokesperson for this, is the Rotary International, eradicating polio. There were over a thousand cases a day in 1985 that were, that were occurring. And the Rotary said, we're going to take this on, generate a $1.2 billion, said we're going to eradicate polio. Huge goal. But over a period of, of time, to up until 2012, I think is 250 known cases worldwide from 1,000 a day in, in 1980. That's the kind of goal that is succinct, it's clear, you can get everybody focused on, and it keeps from having 10 different things that you're trying to develop, trying to raise. So my, my advice is look at what it is that your organization's mission says that you're going to do. Ours says we're going to improve the health of the people we serve, which is about a million people in this marketplace. So the focus that we need to put on improving health really gets into four result, key result areas. One of those is a superior patient experience. Another is one standard of care across 12 hospitals and 300 access points with 23,000 people. Top decile performance. And all of that, the byproduct of all that is financial stability. I mean, that, we're not going to talk about financial stability, but if we can do those three things and do that effectively over the next 10 years, through this change that's going on, we're going to maintain financial stability. Another that I like very much, I've been involved with United Way my whole career. And United Way has reinvented itself several times. And the, the uh, United Way of Suncoast here in, in our market 
has come up with a bold statement of breaking the cycle of generational poverty and focusing on three different areas specifically defined, and it's those three areas that we're going to focus on going forward. That is a much better definition to, from a fundraising point of view to where people are giving today. I mean, we're finding that out when you talk to people. They want to be involved. They want to have something that is specific. How is my money going to be used? How am I going to measure whether it's effective? And those are the things that need to get focused on. So just to spend a couple of minutes, give you a sense of uh, where we are. If you look over on the right side, your right side of the, of the screen, you see where we were in February of 2010. Fee for service, an organization that was principally paid based on doing things. We get paid to admit people in the hospital, we get paid to do x-rays, lab tests, and all of those are done by the virtue of a written order of a physician. The only way you do anything in healthcare is a physician writes the order for that. So in February 2010, this 2,000 pages of the law comes out and says that in the 2,000 pages, it just says one or two things that were meaningful to us. One of those is there's going to be a 180 degree shift in how we're going to get paid. Because in the future, we'll get paid like an insurance company on a premium base, where we get paid for an individual and their family for a whole year. And then we have to figure out how it is that we keep that family healthy but still be able to keep it healthy within the bounds of what we're getting paid if we want to stay in business on a long-term basis. And it's making a significant shift for an organization. It doesn't mean that anybody's jobs change in healthcare. That job of the ICU nurse doesn't change. The job of even the people in the business office, they're going to have different forms. But what it's causing is it's causing 23,000 people to ask the question, how is this going to affect me and how do I need to be thinking differently in a new world as that, as that change occurs? One of the things that we've done when you see that bridge, because in February 2010, we had population health on one side of the gap and, and uh, the fee for service on the other, the episodic care, and the first suggestion was that we would get a motorcycle and I'd ride the motorcycle and jump over the top of that. And I didn't think that was such a good idea. And then there was another suggestion we'd try to hop over and I thought you could only get one hop out of that. So you had to build a foundation. And that bridge didn't exist, but the bridge exists now. We went to a full electronic medical record. We created a physician organization that now is involved in working on guidelines so that we can incent physicians for streamlining the way they're providing care and for physicians to be able to work more effectively together in making decisions on the evidence best practice on how to do something. Because in the other world, it didn't matter. Physicians were trained in all kinds of different places. They showed up with a different idea on how they were going to manage a different diagnosis, and they got paid for that. It didn't matter. In the new world, we've got to figure out how to create one standard of care because you've got to be at one standard of care in order to reach top decile. And the pay coming out of the government is now based on quality measures, which is a good thing for all of us. But in order to maximize those quality measures, you've got to be in the top 10% of all the organizations in the country. So we're challenged with improving the quality of what, how we're delivering care, which is good news. It's different. I think we've provided great quality care underneath a system that has existed for 40 years. But now we're challenged with different things. So we're building that bridge and strengthening that bridge to go from one point to the other. The only reason I share that is that this was a clear and deliberate thought. And we are reinventing ourselves. We started in February of 2010, and we have been reinventing ourselves off of the radar screen because we're, there's a lot of things that most people would not understand why it is that we're doing it to go from one place to another. And building the infrastructure because V 
Vision without infrastructure is like words without sentences. They don't mean anything. They're just words if you don't have a sentence. And if you have a vision and you have no infrastructure, no way of executing on it, it's just a vision. It doesn't mean anything. So the best thing that I can suggest if you go back to one of the Indiana Jones movies, you remember the Take a Leap of Faith? where he's standing there, going to go across the bridge, and he's told, just take a leap of faith, just step, and he looks out there, and there's this, looks like a vast gorge that he's going to step into, and he takes one foot, and he steps, and he ends up on some solid ground right here. That's important for us, I think, to consider Because staying where you are, if you're in a highly changing environment, staying with the status quo is never really going to be a successful option. And the challenge that I think we have is that when we we tripled the number of not-for-profits, we found ourselves in, in a, during a very robust economy, we found ourselves in a sweet spot. But that's changing. You know, and back in that economy, as I recall, there were something like 6,500 hospital organizations in the country. There are now 5,000 projected to be somewhere around 2,500, 3,000 by 2020. A lot of that's partly going to be because of M&A, but it's just the reality. It's not, it's, it's the universe seeking a balance. It's trying to get to a place where we're being able to provide something really meaningful. And to start making that move, I and my board had to take a leap of faith and step out there and say, we're going to go to that location. We're going to do this in order for us to be successful. And the vision is great because once you have a vision, it changes. I mean, when you get to where you think you, it looked like when you get there, it won't look anything like what you thought it was when you started, but you'll know you're there because things change. For us, the, we have this the whole law figured out, and then the Supreme Court changed a big chunk of it, so we changed course. The state of Florida said they're not going to expand the Medicaid program. We changed our course, changed our structure to try to keep on a focus and on a path that was going to get us where we needed to go and build that infrastructure along the way. That to me is what you'd call, and I never like to refer to myself as a visionary leader because, you know, it's really more about practical understanding of what reality is and then figuring out how you escape the noose to get from one place to another and maintain the competitive nature and meet your mission. So thank you very much.